Hi, I'm Anne from Mercer County Library, and I'm going to do another poet today. And the poet is Emily Dickinson, a very famous American poet. She was born in Am Amherst, Massachusetts, in 18 let's see, 1830. And um, her father was a well-known lawyer and prominent citizen, as was her brother, who was also a lawyer. Her mother was bedridden for many years in her later years, and she had a younger sister, Lavinia, three years younger, who she was very close to. Um, they both went to the Amherst Academy, and she was there for seven years, and then she went to the Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, but she was only there for ten months, and that was the extent of her formal education. And she came back home and she was uh, involved in town life, but gradually she withdrew. She withdrew into her poetry, her gardening, her baking, and her inner life. And she wrote many poems, almost 1,800 poems. Some of them were not discovered till after she died by her sister, who wanted to see them published, but in her lifetime there were only 12 poems actually published. And it wasn't for many years, in fact, until 1955, before the full edition of her poems, as she wrote them, was released. Um, in the early poems that were released, those 12, they changed some of the punctuation and some of the syntax to conform with contemporary poetry. She wasn't a contemporary poet. She was much more modern, as you will see as I read some of these poems. And the first one I'm going to start with is kind of a nature poem because she was very, very fond of nature. Most of them, almost all of them, have no titles, so I'll just start in with the poem. And this poem is about a snake seen from a child's point of view and shows the essence of the snake, the appearance and the movements of the snake. A narrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides. You may have met him, did you not? His notice sudden is. The grass divides as if with a comb, a spotted shaft is seen, and then it closes at your feet and opens further on. He likes a boggy acre, a floor too cool for corn. Yet when a child and barefoot, I more than once at morn have passed, I thought, a whiplash upbraiding in the sun. When stooping to secure it, it wrinkled and was gone. Several of nature's people I know, and they know me. I feel for them a transport of cordiality. But never met this fellow attended or alone without a tighter breathing and zero at the bone leaves you with a constricted feeling. Zero at the bone, a great phrase. Another poem that describes her feeling about nature, this time how nature is intoxicating. It almost leaves you as you were drinking. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the vats upon the rind yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of air am I and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more, till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. So here you see such great lines as, inebriate of air am I. And she describes this blue sky as from inns of molten blue. And then the image of the little tippler leaning against the sun is rather great, isn't it? Okay, she was also passionate, so I'm going to read a passionate play. And it could be a play, uh, not a play, it could be a poem of romantic longing, or it could be a poem of spiritual love. Let's decide or think about it. Wild nights, wild nights, where I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart in port, 
done with the compass, done with the chart, rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but moor tonight in thee. So Dickens was deeply religious, but she was not conventional. She stopped going to church when she was 22. Um, in a letter to her cousin, a couple years after this poem was written, she said, Dying is a wild night and a new road. I suppose we have, we're all thinking of immortality, at times so stimulated that we cannot sleep. And then in the section, the heart is in the port and done with the compass, so that's a safe port against the wild wind. So I'm going to just read this again while you think about this poem. Wild nights, wild nights, were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart in port, done with the compass, done with the chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but moor tonight in thee. So the reader has to make up his or her mind as to whether that's romantic longing or spiritual ones. Now, many of her poems uh, spoke of death, and when she was 14, she was traumatized by the death of her cousin and close friend, Sophia, and so much so, um, she was so melancholy, her parents sent her away to Boston to stay with her aunt for a while. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children played, their lessons scarcely done. We passed the fields of growing grain, we passed the setting sun. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice but a mound. Since then, tis centuries, but each feels shorter than the day. I first surmised the horse's head were toward eternity. So you noted the grave mound was compared to a house in that poem. Interesting. Another poem about death that's both kind of comforting and also at the same time frightening. It recalls a poem by Keats. And you remember, may remember this, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that's all you need to know on earth and all you need to know. And she very much admired the poems of John Keats and also the poems of Shakespeare, who um, in one of his lines said, truth and beauty, very big. Okay, so here's the poem. I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb when one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. He questioned softly, why I failed? For beauty, I replied, and I for truth, themselves are one, we brethren are, he said. And so, as kinsmen met a night, we talked between the rooms, until the moss reached our lips and covered up our names. So here it's comforting, they both died for an ideal and they were kinsmen in the grave, but frightening the moss is covering up their names, and it's showing the indifference of nature to, you, to human beings. Whatever you die for, the moss will cover up your name. And here's one about a funeral. I felt a funeral in my brain, and mourners to and fro kept treading, treading, till it seemed that sense was breaking through. And when they all were seated, a service like a drum kept beating, beating, till I thought my mind was going numb. And then I heard them lift a box and creak across my soul. With those same boots of lead again, then space began to toll. As all the heavens were a bell, and being but an ear, an eye, and silence, some strange race wrecked, solitary here. And then a plank in reason broke. And I dropped down and down and hit a world at every plunge and finished knowing then. 
so enough with death. Let's go back to just imagery. So here's an image of, in a poem, of a bird. So see if you can kind of picture this bird. A bird came down the walk. He did not know I saw. He bit an ankle worm in halves and ate the fellow raw. And then he drank a dew from a convenient grass and then hopped sideways to the wall to let a beetle pass. He glanced with rapid eyes that hurried all abroad. They looked like frightened beads, I thought. He stirred his velvet head like one in danger. Cautious, I offered him a crumb. And he unrolled his feathers and rode him softly home. Then ours divide the ocean to silver for a seam, or butterflies off banks of noon leap plashless as they swim. So at the beginning of the poem, is, you see it, the bird. And then after she offers him a crumb, he gives, she gives comparisons as the bird's taking off for flight. Um, the comparisons with rowing through the ocean or butterflies leaping off the banks of noon. Banks of noon kind of doesn't make any sense, you see. Noontime, the butterflies could fly, but coming from the banks. Um, they're plashless, meaning they're, they're smoothly not swimming through the sky like, um, like they're swimming, but no, no splashing. Okay, then this one, this next one, kind of um, is like Emily Dickinson, reserved and uh, making distinctions between people and selecting who she wants to be with. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. To her divine majority, present no more. Unmoved, she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. I've known her from an ample nation choose one, then close the valves of her attention like stone. The soul is creating a private space, as she did. And the last one I'm going to read is a famous poem that is kind of um, relevant to the world today. It's a metaphor about hope being like a little bird perched inside and singing. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soil, soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in eternity it asked a crumb of me. So there are many, many more poems of Emily Dickinson that you can find on the internet. You can find the books in the library, and if you go on our website, you can find it in our electronic books. We have the poems, we have the letters of Emily Dickinson, and biographies of Emily Dickinson. So do read more of her poems, and I suggest you read them not once, but twice or more, and then you get to the meaning of the poems. Thank you for listening to this story of Emily Dickinson.